Well, hey, my name is Ryan Earnhardt from creativesoundlab.tv, where audio recording is an art form. Well, today's actually part four of my mixing drum series, um, mixing drums without samples. So what I want to do for you today is just show you my own techniques of using gates. Uh, I haven't liked them in the past, and every time I threw a gate on, it was always messing with my attack. I would hear this audible click with the gate coming on, and if I slowed down the gate to get rid of that clicking of the gate coming on, then it would mess up my attack. The kick drum, the toms, they never really sounded right. So I want to show you a little technique that I've developed. Uh, I'm sure other people do this, um, but I want to show you my technique for using gates. So here's what we're going to be covering in this episode. First, we're going to be IDing the problem. Now, what is really the problem that we're trying to uh, fix by applying a gate to a particular drum track? Step number two is to duplicate these tracks and shift. Step number three is sidechain. In addition to my main method today, I actually have two options that are extra. Um, I have an automation method I'll go over. I also have another method using hysteresis. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so really the best way to combat this rumble here is really to use a gate. And there's a few techniques I wanna to give today. Uh, my favorite is actually uh, using what I call a dummy track. It's something that I, um, I use from my, my electronic music days of, of triggering uh, automation and stuff on the fly. Uh, but really it's a term that I use to triggering a gate so it triggers um, to something else instead of this wave here. And uh, really, the reason why I don't like gates uh, and why I have to use kind of roundabout methods is because gates are basically acting as uh, volume adjusters. So um, as soon as something hits a signal, let's say this one is negative 10 from Unity, then that's a threshold, it'll open up. It'll allow that signal to pass through. So it, in a sense, it, it actually um, turns volume down um, as a default. And when something hits the threshold, it turns up the volume and can be very, very sudden as well. And then it also turns down the volume and it can be slow or fast depending on how we set it. And hopefully we turn down the volume in time to turn down this stuff here. So we're letting this stuff through, we're turning this stuff down. The problem I have with this is that this attack is almost never musical sounding to my ears. Uh, usually there's maybe a little snapping sound that happens here because I am trying to capture this very first transient here. And in doing so, it, there's an audible um, artifact here that's happening. I don't like that. So then I have to slow it down a little bit, but when I slow it down, I'm actually kind of chopping this off here. We're not actually hearing it. It's, it's, it's more like, it's, it's more looking like this. And so all of a sudden my wave is less aggressive. I don't have that that attack out of that kick drum. But all of a sudden, my wave's kind of chopped a little bit. And so one method that, that I've used, and it kind of goes back to my electronic um, days where um, I was triggering automation on the fly and, and, and doing things uh, remotely, but applying it to tracks, is you basically copy this track, and then you shift it forward a little bit. So let's say that the, the shifted track actually starts here, and then the gate for this one is actually looking to this track down here. So the gate for this track is actually being triggered right here. So it's being turned up and then released like this because it's looking to this track here. And if you don't have side chaining, which is where one track, one effect is looking to another track's content um, as far as uh, when, to, um, when to apply compression, is basically the threshold is established by another track. And so if you don't have that, we can talk about how, how to get around this. But really that's, the, that's my method, is I'm able to add a slow attack, a slow attack to my gate so it's musical, it's not audible, I don't hear a snap, and it's open in time for my full transient to get through. And then it allows it through, and then it basically musically slowly reduces, and then it's reducing this area here. Let's check it out in some real world examples. Okay, so this problem really first occurred to me when I was trying to get really powerful low end out of my kick drum, but uh, you know, really I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really add it 
because there was so much rumble, so much kind of dribbling of that beater, you know, multiple uh, hits on that beater after the main hit of that kick drum. And so I realized that either I have, I literally have, have got to go through and, you know, pull down um, the space between each kick note, or I can get a creative use of a gate. And I really never liked the gate because, you know, using gates, it always has that weird attack. And I can demonstrate that for you today, uh, what the attack sounds like versus uh, kind of a method that I've uh, really grown uh, fond of using. Um, but let's first uh, just kind of look at um, the practical applications of gating. And really, this is where stuff really starts to sound really good. Now, I have been saying that um, these don't have to be applied in the order that we're learning about them in this series. To be all, uh, to be completely honest, um, really, we should almost gate uh, uh, first thing because um, by the time we add compression and EQ, um, you know, we're just going to be bringing up the noise, say, um, and the compression, and then EQ, we're just going to be making it worse and worse. So, um, really. Uh, a more practical uh, process of, of ordering them um, as far as the the order of the effects here is that the gate can actually go right up first and this is kind of the order of how we've applied the effects um, based on just okay objectively thinking about do we need this uh, you know a compressor do we need EQ and then do we need a gate and so really that's the that's the way that we've been learning about it but in real life, really, uh, we can always, uh, you know, scoot this up ahead. And then now this compressor has nice, clean audio um, that it's going to be uh, compressing instead of, you know, compressing all that junk in between the notes, for example. So uh, don't be afraid to mix these around. Uh, all these things uh, in real life really do not come uh, in the order of compression, EQ, and gating. Uh, so you really have to you know, be okay with experimenting with this stuff. And so my first, my first, uh, you know, application of this obviously would be for that kick. It's really quite noisy. Uh, here's a song so far. So, you know, the question would be, I wonder if there's a way that we could just clear all that junk up. And so what I've done is um, I've, added a, uh, I've added a gate to this, this main kick channel here. And my technique, instead of just having it um, react to its own channel here, what I've done is I've actually duplicated um, this kick channel and made a dummy channel. And so I just call it DUM kick or dummy kick, okay? And this uh, this actually isn't going into our mix. Um, you know, the master send, uh, it's not going to, to the main stereo bus, okay? Um, to put it in other terms. And um, so it's just there, okay? It's, it's there playing along, um, but it's there to go into maybe effects sends or wherever we want to send it, but it's not a part of the mix, okay? So just make sure that you understand that it's not a part of the mix. It's just hanging out there and it's playing along with our other tracks. But what is listening to this track is our gate from our main kick channel. So uh, instead of um, listening to its main input of the actual track laid on track two, kick of the suprophonic take, uh, instead it's actually picking up an auxiliary input uh, in which I actually set uh, over here um, by um, kind of a receive from track three. And it is uh, in Reaper terms, you know, you set this to audio one slash two going into the audio one slash two of the dummy kick channel going into the three four of the main kick channel that's what that means there and then over in the compressor you set this right here and you're good to go now i'm pretty new to reaper now this is uh, kakos reaper um, you can really use any DAW to do this stuff with. A lot of the DAWs can have side chaining features. And if yours uh, doesn't do any side chaining whatsoever, 
Um, that's unfortunate, but it, there there are other ways to to get these same great results. Um, I'll go over a couple of them. Uh, this is just really one out of three results um, that I have for you today. So this first this first um, method is really called side chaining, and I'm using a dummy track to trigger um, the main gate of this first track. And really, what I'm doing, if I can uh, zoom in here on this track, is it's not, you know, it's it's kind of pointless to just copy this track and then have it feed in. But the secret is, is that I'm actually scooting it ahead. So I just scoot it just a little bit ahead. Okay, so here's the main kick. Here is the dummy kick. So my main kick is actually going to be triggered ahead of the kick that we hear. And therefore, we are not going to hear any sort of... Uh, weird attack or anything, it will be fully open, allowing the natural attack of the drum to come through um, unharmed. And so that's really the secret sauce there, is, is um, triggering this gate so that it's not messing with our attack. Now, um, you don't even have to do this. Uh, some gates um, have really nice features. I mean, look at this pre-open. I can actually set this to be open, you know, let's, I would probably put it, I don't know, maybe four or five. Uh, to be honest, I haven't really played with this a whole lot. Um, but some gates actually have this built in. And there's a reason for it because <laughs> they're just like me. They hate the artifacts. And so somebody was thoughtful enough to to build in this feature. It's a really nice feature of, of this particular gate. And so um, instead of, let's see here. Let me, let me actually play you uh, the difference. Um, this first example is going to be the gate triggering in the traditional manner. And I'm going to have it set um, basically as quick as it can go. Hopefully it won't mess up our, our attack of the kick. And then it'll release. Okay, so pretty basic, right? Now I can slow that down a little bit. So as I speed it up, you hear that little that little snap? That that snap is is really what I don't like. I can slow it down to try to get rid of it. But the attack of the drum, the the rock and roll part of that drum is just gone now. And, you know, if I just take away the gate, you know, the, the kick is just going boom, 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 and the snare is poking through. And it's just messy. So, um, you know, I'm not able to, like, add my, say, aggressive low end, you know. Um, let's just say, for example, I just want to go nuts on this. You know, and um, but that's that's just crazy. So so what I can do is I can add a gate so that it focuses that sustain of that kick. But with a gate, I have weird attack. I have a snap. So this is where my procedure kind of comes into play. Is that I've duplicated this and I've scooted it forward just a little bit. I had to trim a little bit off the front so I could just kind of nudge it forward, and then I set this to this main, uh, the part that we hear actually listens, its gate listens to this dummy track. The dummy track isn't heard, but the gate is triggered ahead of time. So I can actually slow this down so it doesn't snap open, and it'll still be fully open by the time the attack of the drum hits. Uh, let's see how it sounds. Hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll sound awesome. Okay, let's try scooting it up just a little bit, and I'm just kind of doing this, just eyeballing it here. Okay, let's try this. And we can hear that, that literally there's some sort of cymbal bleed or something getting through, and there's just kind of like this, but up, but up, but up, but up, where the mic, the the track is turned on, and then it's allowing the kick to be in there. 
Let's listen again. Listen how they're, it's kind of flamming. Uh, flamming is a drumming, drumming term where it's like two hits close together kind of thing. Okay, so now we can um, really just uh, slow down. Yeah, we can we can slow down that attack. And you'll have to play with this a little bit to, to really make it work. But it does work. Okay, I use it for toms. I use it for uh, for kick. I really don't use it for snare. I try to keep the snare as naturally as possible. And I know in Ableton Live, uh, you can actually uh, set this so it's not completely um, you know, taking it out. In fact, uh, this right here might be the same option here. So minus 6 instead. Oh, no, that's actually the... Uh, the indicator of the threshold. Okay, <laughs> but I know in Ableton Live you can actually set it so that it's only reducing, you know, say 10 dB when the gate is just fully um, activated. So, you know, in this state right here, it would be, uh, it wouldn't be nothing. It would, it would at least be giving you something. So it's able to kind of ease, um, you know, the 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 harshness of what it's doing. And then in the context. There was where on the crutches in the shadows. And obviously I really don't like that EQ choice. I mean, that's like what I've been telling you not to do is just take something and jack it up. But um, that's kind of the point though, is that um, if there's something that's keeping you from making the EQ adjustments that you would like to do, then the possibility is, is that gating could be your friend. Um, let's go on to uh, something else here. Uh, let's see here. I've done it to the tom. So let's see here. Okay, so same kind of deal. I've done it to the tom here. Let's find where it actually goes in. Here we go. Okay, one more time. And you can actually see that, that there's something just a, a touch faster than the actual note. And if I were to zoom in here, you can see that here's the, the dummy track, okay? It's just a copied track, okay? But it's just, it's just that much earlier. Okay, here's the, the track we're actually hearing. So the gate's actually triggered from this track, and we hear this one. It's open by the time we hear that transient uh, beginning right there. Now, method two, um, if you don't have side chaining, um, then method two is just to automate. And this is a pretty basic concept, but it really can make a difference. Uh, you know, 10 extra minutes doing this really does, uh, does help a mix. And so if I were to uh, kind of zoom out here, you know, we know that a tom, tom one, comes in, um, you know, kind of three times during the song or whatever. So we can just go through and uh, draw in when that track turns on and when the track turns off. So let me turn off the gate so we only have one method kind of working here. And now our track is on. And now the track should be off. So what we're going to do is we're going to find uh, the next point that we'd like the track on. Uh, in my program, I hold shift and click, and that just puts a little uh, transitional point there for the automation. And then, uh, let's see, now I have basically this um, you know, area here that the track is off. So you know, I click kind of uh, you know, a starting point, a point that it's all the way down, you know, 
and I pretty much do both sides of the edit here. So I'll find the point that it goes out. So let's, let's see here, I'll have a kind of a fade coming to here. At this point it'll be off, and then I go all the way to the point where I want to bring it back in. Right there, click just before it, and have a kind of a duration of the fade in, and then bring the whole thing down. And then this whole area is turned off, and that's, that's pretty much what I do. So I really only have to zoom in to the start and the end of, of where things are actually happening and changing. So go something like this, and we're done. So now we don't have that uh, sympathetic vibration of just kind of like this hum, hum, hum um, that vibrates along with that kick drum. So that's method two, is literally just to, to automate it. It's not a big deal. Um, I wouldn't do it for kick. That's pretty insane. Um, you could also you know go in here and and actually you know, draw notes like this, and then, you know, do this kind of deal. This is this is getting a little nuts. Um, I don't know that I would do this. I, I've tried it in the past, and it took me like an hour to get through like half of the drums, and it was just like, it just got to be stupid after a while. So... Uh, yeah, you, re you really have to decide for yourself how much you want to go crazy with this. You know, for me, drums, I like to keep them as natural as possible. Only if it's an issue do I need any of these gating or automation techniques. Um, for something that's like a really polished sound, um, yeah, I pretty much do this um, kind of as a standard to make sure those toms aren't, you know, sympathetically ringing throughout the verse and places where they're not even being played. Um, the third method is really something that is um, uh, found in like the, the UAD plugin, the Neve uh, channel strip uh, that has the uh, hysteresis, and um, it's also available um, on other gates and things like that. And maybe you can find one with your program, um, but it's it's something really cool, and I don't even completely understand how it works. Um, but basically, it just it's like um, it's like this this flux as far as the threshold goes. So it it basically, if uh, you know the drummer has some variation in the tone, it actually has some give to where it'll allow um, that note to come in. So it's not like just a th a set threshold, but it allows it to kind of be more forgiving. So it's not like you miss it or you make it, and so you have some notes that aren't actually heard because it didn't actually hit that threshold. It's, it's a, it makes it a lot more forgiving um, so that you can, um, you know, set your gates more, <laughs> more musically, really. And so uh, let's just hear that. Uh, let's see here. The main, I want to put it on the main input. And uh, let's see here. I want to use this pre-EQ. Let's see how this sounds, actually. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to really be um, picky. Okay. So I want to make the I'm going to make the, the signal work for it to get um, this gate turned on. I want to see how this history assist really works. And here's here's without it. So, you know, you kind of have little notes that are kind of poking in to the threshold. And really what this is doing is it's just it's it's just buying you some forgiveness with your settings. Um like I said, man, I I I'm really not relying on gates to 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 make great mixes and music and stuff. So, um this is just one of those things that I it's like almost magic to me of how exactly it knows um what to pick out to let through the gate. Um, so if you have an example of a resource of what history is really how it works, I'd love to hear it. Um, but it's a great little plus, uh, for any sort of gate because it just, it, it just lets you set it so, uh, so, so easily. So yeah, I really dig that. So here it is in context. Empty, 
So what it's allowing me to do is basically crank this channel if I'd like to and make it as loud as I would uh, musically um, uh, see appropriate. And it doesn't allow any anything, all the other junk through that I really don't want. Another great feature about gating is that now you have this under control. Uh, like I said at the beginning, um, you know, these things always don't go in the order that I've taught you in. It actually could go first. So now we don't have any uh, weirdness out of other cymbals and drums. And then now if we want to add some clarity to that, um, the attack of the tom, now we can because now it's pretty much isolated. So now let me kind of do that. Okay, now in the mix. So now we're clearly hearing dig a dig, dig a dig. dig. And this is a huge plus because you know, later on we actually get tons of symbol. Uh, in a previous episode, I was like hunting for like crazy cymbal wash, and I thought it was a room mic, but it wasn't. It was actually the uh, the tom. So, uh, you know, there's just crazy stuff going on in this mic. Um, so, yeah, for toms, uh, gating, uh, automation, hysteresis, uh, those three applications of cleaning up the tracks are really your friend. So the next episode is actually going to be one inspired by some of the viewer comments. It's about mixing snare drum that really was tracked in a small room. It's a really small sounding snare and it just doesn't sound right. It sucks. Well, I'm going to really conquer that problem. I'm going to really talk about how to apply effects spe specifically to snare drum. And this will be how to, um, you know, uh, top and bottom relationship, making sure you're getting nice and full sound to really how to add reverb, to really get a three-dimensional sound out of your drum tracks. If you don't have your snare drum right, it really sounds like a flat drum sound. If you have a flat drum sound, your whole recording sounds cheap. So it really does come down sometimes to how good your snare sounds. So we'll cover that next week. I'll see you then.